we start with uh, Denisa and Anna. Denisa and Anna have been a graduates of the graphic design of the Ritfold Academy, right? I'm exactly. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> I think this is where the whole this is where the whole idea also came to be. Yes. Um, so they started exploring uh, play, a series of playgrounds designed by Aldo van Eyck, which is quite a famous architect, was quite a famous architect, still is, doesn't, yeah, whatever, <laughs> in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and they have walked through a publication which is called 17 Playgrounds, and it's basically an investigation of 17, uh, let's say, designed uh, play spaces that he has created in, in Amsterdam, right? Yeah, in the center. In yeah. the center. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they are owners or like the family of an adopted igloo, which they all, you can also see on the picture, uh, one of the designs that Aldo Matai uh, created, which we were lucky to have in September in the exhibition that we organized in that specific place as part of the Unmaking the Netherlands program. So I think what they're gonna do, it's basically <laughs> guide us through uh, the research tap into the, uh, let's say, the, the story behind Aldo Van Eyck, and also introduce what is really happening around this like weird adoption with the uh, playground and all. So we're gonna continue with the presentation, then we will open it up to questions and answer, we'll have a small break, and then we will continue with uh, Tanya Chandra, mm -mm. right? Uh, so thanks again, and we can begin, right? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe in the beginning, we would like to uh, say thank you very much for having us here. It was a very nice experience also to work on an exhibition which was here earlier in September, as Nikos mentioned. Uh, so to the project, it started in uh, 2013, uh, which is the year of our graduation in the Retail Academy, where we visited a couple of playgrounds uh, in Amsterdam and uh, we were immediately triggered by them for some reason because one of the reasons is that you kind of can miss them easily but uh, on the other hand once you get appro approach them you kind of discover that they are very unique in a way they are exercised in a in a city so they are not right in your face but uh, once you start to research them and look into how they were made and designed you are more and more like uh, intrigued and you want to know more yeah what we what we noticed when we were uh, looking at the playgrounds that van Eyck designed in amsterdam we we saw that lots of them have had disappeared and were replaced by this kind of modern uh, plastic colorful structures that often have um, they, they function like from a catalog like that you just pick they pick them and then you just place them in a city yeah yeah and um, so when we were going to different locations in the center we we, s we each time discovered that another playground that used to be a, an original von Eyck playground was replaced by something looking like this or like this, in the shape of a castle, in the shape of a dragon. And um, I think one of the most important aspects of the work that Van Eyck did is that his playgrounds really merged well within the urban uh, surrounding, whereas these things really have some kind of their own language and, and you tend to not even consider them as part of, of the public space because you really look at them as something only meant for children and you just pass by them if you're not one of the children using them or one of the parents that have to. And you find them there. everywhere all around the Europe so in that sense they are not unique in the way that the designer is always anonymous and you kind of you are almost not even surprised when you see it because it's just too obvious the, by the colors and on comparison this is one of the ar uh, older pictures of uh, Aldo van Eyck playground. Yeah so it's quite a quite a contrast of what we found of what was left by him although this is one of the original one uh, and and what we found was replaced, um, what replaced his playgrounds. Um, actually, in the beginning, uh, um, yeah, he started creating playgrounds in the after-war period, but before that there wasn't really, um, there weren't any public playgrounds in Amsterdam. So basically, you, uh, <laughs> you had um, a couple of them which were kind of um, based on a membership. They were for the upper-class citizens and um, they were, yeah, they were only for those children that had parents that wanted to pay a certain amount of money each month for their children to be able to go there. And on the contrary, you had these uh, like empty lots through the city because of the war, and uh, these lots were, of course, like city planners were really intrigued by them, like how to change the cityscape because it was very sad uh, to see the city in such a, in such a ruins. And, and then, yeah, someone in the uh, city of Amsterdam department, Jacoba Mulder, 
decided like something had to change. There was an increasing number of cars, so the children that weren't happy to, to be able to play in the, in the playgrounds that were restricted by membership, they could only play on the streets, and this was getting more and more dangerous. So, so we see also that there was a problem that it, it was not uh, enough to have a private playgrounds anymore, but there was m more of a public of children which needed to also find their own domain. Yeah, and, <coughs> and that's when uh, Aldo von Eyck was given the task to, to create at first one playground as an experiment, and later on they gave him this kind of overlooked places in the center as locations where, uh, where he could design playgrounds for children. And here is a series of pictures that we found in the city archive that really document how these places were completely unused and overlooked and um, how they, turned how to they be transformed yeah. to, to places that were used a lot and not only, uh, not only by children but also really became these places where, where the community would come together and where social interaction could take place. Whereas what? before they were just kind of, yeah, they didn't, they didn't do so much with them before. And here we also see that the projects he took on were interesting for the case that the floor planning of the playgrounds were always different. So he was literally filling in the holes in the city. So th compared to nowadays, you kind of uh, plan the playgrounds or the public spaces already when you are planning the, the areas of the city. But th there it was like coming after that, which created a completely different symbiosis with the city and more natural kind of... Uh, yeah, it was really this bottom-up kind of way of filling in the, the urban tissue and, and finding locations where play could take place. So here this once was a, a traffic intersection and um, what also happened actually is that a lot of parents uh, sent letters to the Gemeente, to the city of Amsterdam, asking for playgrounds because they started to discover that here and there public playgrounds were built and and then came up with, with possible locations. So they, so they say even like suggested it. And there maybe, we maybe the street is quite big, can you not broaden the sidewalk? And, and often this would actually happen. So it was kind of a process of, of citizens also coming up with solutions and, and the city of Amsterdam actually listening to the suggestions. That so there was given. a huge cooperation between public and the city and there, there was like, I think that was very nice about that these playgrounds could happen from that point. Yeah, this is another great example of how how they completely, I mean, of course, this is also quite rare these days. So n now a lot of his playgrounds have disappeared and they have been replaced by buildings or parking lots. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of a luxury to have the playground like this nowadays in the middle of the city because, the, of course, it's quite expensive and they prefer to build there something what's going to bring them more money than the public space. Um, in total, I think he designed over 700 playgrounds, so it really, and, and this was only in the city of Amsterdam, so it was really a huge amount of them. And together they created this kind of web of playgrounds uh, that gave children their own recognizable domain. Um, so where in the beginning he was completely using these empty spaces in the center to fill them up, he later became, uh, his playgrounds became an integral part of the after-war. So it, it, it extended over the ring of Amsterdam, where they were more like planned within the, within the areas. Now we are looking at the, one of the original drawings of Aldo van Eyck, of actually of the play equipment, which he designed, because it's very important to say that he also designed uh, each of the elements of the playground, not just the compositions of the playgrounds, which was quite unique at that time. Yeah, he designed all the play equipment himself. He had two children and they were often asked to, to check or to, to try them out. His own children. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 he kind of uh, practiced it with his own children. And uh, so he, ma he made this kind of toolbox of different play elements and each time when he was given a different location... Um, he did he the various uh, like variations of them and uh, the important thing is to say that they were stimulating the child's imagination because of the way they were designed. So they were never, like you couldn't put a finger on it that that's a horse or that's a car or that's a castle. It was rather an object which was supposed to trigger uh, your imagi child's imagination and therefore practice child's creativity. Or yeah, I think that's also one of the contrasts with the, with the plastic <coughs> structures that we showed before, that these are so um, elementary and simple. Um, and therefore can be used in any kind of way. And also they didn't, of course the sand pit, you know, it's you, you go in and you, you create different things with the sand, but also climbing frames that I'll show you later, they, they can turn into all these different kinds of uh, And he things. also, of course, thought about in the sand pit, which we see now, you see that the rim is lowered down in some part, that was very useful for the, uh, for the smaller kids to enter the sand pit, or he even like put inside of it some kind of a 
tables, play tables, which was good for kids to kind of build the sculptures from the sand. So he thought also about the functionality or the way the kids use the sand pit and not just about the, that it's a box full of sand. And he, they were in a quite a huge sizes, so many children could play in them at the same time. And um, these are actually jumping stones. Yeah. Yeah. So he had he first used these things as play tables in his sand pits, but afterwards they they became uh, uh, yeah another play element that he would also use outside of the sand pits. Um, and for example, you could use them by running around them or from for jumping from one to the next. Um, a different example of one of the things he designed is the climbing mountain. It's one of the most sculptural elements. It's not so easy to find it nowadays. This is uh, one of the Vondel Park in the middle of the city, but uh, it's not so many of them left at the moment. And uh, most of the play, uh, play equipment he designed is also very static. I think all of them are static in order for the child to do activity around them. So not that they would be movable and the child is moving with them, but chi a child has to run around or exercise some activity instead of the equipment to move. Yeah, and then he started with these tumbling bars, but later he also created climbing frames. Um, they came, for example, in this igloo shape, um, but became also in, into this large sculpture uh, stru structures. And um they are made of aluminium, and they are made in a special way that they do a form and they cast it in. But nowadays, the tech technological aspect of it changed a little bit. But this, which we are looking at now, they are still originals. You can kind of recognize it by the way in a welding or how they are connected. Um, so mm -hmm. with this set of elements that he had, he he each time went to a location and uh, made a different design depending on what that certain site needed. So it's not that he had a certain standard playground and that he would copy implement it, it or yeah. copy it many times. But uh, almost all these 700 playgrounds were somehow um, unique. In yeah, unique, site specific. <laughs> and they always had a different um, composition that. Um, in which he was very much uh, making sure that he created the perfect balance within all the elements. So maybe the sand pit was, was the most massive one, it was of concrete, but somehow it was as, as important as the smaller jumping stones or as the climbing uh, uh, frames that he made. And there, was, there was like this rhythm of, of the play elements and the relativity, which was kind of his biggest philosophy that things should be in relation with each other and nothing should be central, therefore nothing should be hierarchical. So in that order, he was always placing the elements with this rhythm and the flow. So the kids kind of approach it and uh, that, 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 sl that slows them down and then they can do any activity and go out anytime because it was never fenced off in that sense. Yeah, here's some examples of, uh, of the floor plan. Uh, and another one where you see that his playgrounds aren't fenced off. Uh, what he used was most of the time that he planted the trees in order to, to give it another rhythm or to, for example, a kind of point out that the child shouldn't go further than this. So he was using any other ways, but mostly natural, like planting. Um, floor planning, uh, floor, like floor, how do you call them? Floor tiles were <laughs> important <laughs> in his designs because that was the way how he kind of separated different areas of play and the uh, space in between each element was as well as uh, important as the elements themselves because the kids, most of the time, they played on the element, but sometimes they created games in between them. So there was always enough space to go from one to another. Yeah, which is, yeah, here you can see that he also wanted to show that by, uh, by using two different kinds of tiles. And that is also one of the things in the playgrounds that you can still find. Uh, this, this is often uh, some, something that you cannot find anymore because they had to use these uh, spongy floors because of the safety of the children. So you're going to see later, but once replacing it by the spongy floors, they never really kept uh, this, this the main composition. Yeah, the composition, which was quite important. Uh, actually, this is one of the extracts from our book, 17 Playgrounds, which we, uh, as we said, we started in a graduation year because we fe felt the need to introduce this this topic more to the public, since we felt that there is a lot of discussion concerning the architecture of Aldefenag and a lot of like uh, buildings in Amsterdam are trying to become monuments, like uh, city and uh, daughter of Aldefenag are uh, like trying to solve this issue, but the playgrounds were not really 
Like we, we felt that they were a bit overlooked somehow. Yeah, and no one really paid attention to it in any book you could find, maybe one chapter about it, but it was it was kind of surprising to us that no one no one was discussing it. Yeah, or stepping up to, to the disappearance of them, because where you saw one of those maps before, that there were quite a lot of them in the center, um, we, we went through mainly the, the center area of Amsterdam to, to find out which ones were still remaining and uh, came up with these 17 places, which not are, they aren't all uh, still original playgrounds. Some just have a, a trace of Aldo van Eyck by having a climbing frame that he designed or by still being a playground, uh, but all the equipment is replaced by this modern uh, playground. Equipment. But we thought that this is kind of a number and it's within the ring of Amsterdam of, uh, that people can revisit and like uh, go through. So we called our book a tour guide. Therefore, you can actually go from one location to another and see these different areas in the east, west and the center. <coughs> and within each chapter of the book, uh, we show the uh, location, but we also introduce you more into the research which we did concerning the playgrounds of Aldo van Eyck. Yeah, so it's set up in, in three parts, divided in the, in the west, um, east and south of the city. And um, by taking our reader to a different location, we each time want to introduce them to a different aspect. So at first we, uh, we tell you a bit about uh, the inspiration uh, Aldo van Eyck uh, found in the art world and in the journeys that he made. And then we continue to to each separate, separate element, element that he designed. And the, the, the materiality of the elements, like what, the, what was the materials that were designed, why these specific materials melt well with the scape of the city. And uh, all of the material of the book we did ourselves. So we took photographs, we did maps, and we wrote our own text. We are not really uh, uh, like professional writers, but we try to use like accessible language. So important fact was to just bring the message to the people and just to speak about this topic more and more in order for people to pick up on that. Yeah, maybe to save a couple of those that are still in the tour guide of disappearing of, or of turning into modern playgrounds. Um, it would be nice if we could bring you to Amsterdam and actually show you the, the locations, but um, since that's a bit difficult, we will show you the pictures of 17 locations today. Um, mm. And we start with this one in Wester Park, which is just a really small uh, element left, uh, so a couple of jumping stones next to a walking path in the uh, in Wester Park, quite a popular park in Amsterdam. Followed by this one where you still find um, benches that he, uh, that he made and um, three sand pits, but uh, you can see on the left that, it's, that this one is already sharing its space with a typical Dutch whip kip and a, a slide. Um, so basically you can already see that his design is being accompanied by those things that he didn't necessarily uh, um, even know about. <laughs> yeah, or, or you know, it, they have this different approach. So they have one function of, of how to be used and they already have a shape of, I don't know if this is a motor or... or it's a or, horse. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's kind of interesting to see that uh, what, they, what their current state is. And we also decided therefore to not use the archival images that we showed you before, but we only... Um, include images that are taken this last few years. Yeah, because we thought that when we take a current photographs of it, it's going to completely change the, the idea of the playgrounds because it's, it's easy to like playgrounds of Aldo van Eyck and look at the archive images and they're full of kids playing around. But we wanted to also show that it's not anymore so happy and it's not anymore uh, the idea of the playground. So by taking the pictures nowadays, we felt like we're going to emphasize this current state and stage in which they are. Um, here we have a nice uh, clip, maybe we can turn off the lights for a second. Um, so when we were walking around Amsterdam we always found it interesting also to just observe what's going on on a playground. So this is one of the examples of very spontaneous day. <laughs> Louder. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, actually, that was also one of the first playground which he designed on the Barton plane, but you're going to see it later in the in the preview. Ooh. 
or maybe yeah. <laughs> um, actually you can leave it on for a bit <laughs> thank you um, this is the, the sixth location in our uh, tour guide it's in the Heda Mark, the center of Amsterdam and um, it's a typical uh, example of how he used the traditional squares of the center as a location for playgrounds. And, and also, also here you can see maybe the size of the sand pit. It was always quite huge for many kids to play together, since his playgrounds also played a lot with the idea that sh children should interact and the play equipment shouldn't be just used by one person, but many kids should be playing at the same time to also exercise the social aspect of the game. Then we continue to the seventh location, which is rather new. Um, because I think it was 2013 that the Rijksmuseum uh, incorporated a couple of the original climbing frames uh, and other elements that Van Eyck designed. Which um, is actually a kind of a nice statement because they, they took it into their collection and included it in, into the garden where it was designed in a different composition but uh, still it found a lot of visitors and it, I think it gave just a great... Uh, uh, how do you say that? <laughs> well, it gave them yeah. a status somehow. Yeah, so, status, yeah. so when this happened, there was also a couple of uh, articles in the newspapers writing about them, and this is, this is somehow uh, the kind of attention that we want these playgrounds to have. Um, because it would be a pity if all of them disappear and, and are being replaced by playgrounds that are not as, uh, as well thought of as the ones he designed. Another mm -hmm. one in the Vondel Park, quite a simple one, only a sand pit. But there is a lot of them in the in the park. Uh, actually, there is another video. <laughs> this video is to show you maybe also the kind of size of the sand pit in a exercise form. <laughs> So we show you videos only to kind of, it's just the documentation pieces to, to kind of understand the scale and also how it is designed to really get, like with the time of the, how we walk through the uh, sand pit, you kind of, only them can get the size. We felt that it's a nice exercise of how to show it. Um, this is the playground in Vondel Park. Uh, I think it's one of the most intact playgrounds of Van Eyck in the center. So some of them are, are still, quite uh, um, comparable to the original compositions that he made, but most of those are to be found outside of the center, whereas the ones <coughs> really within the ring of Amsterdam <coughs> are, are rapidly... But we see here that the, the floor, actually the floor is changed by this spongy floor. So also the areas uh, of the f floor tiles are disappearing. Yeah. Another one in the park, this, um, this thing that you see in the front in the summer is filled with a bit of water, so actually that's kind of a variation of the sandpit, but but uh, it's more, more of a fountain now, yeah. yeah. Um, 
another small clip. This was one of the bigger climbing frames. They exist in various sizes. So this was one in the Vondel Park, which is quite huge. And also while being there and talking to children, you get to know a lot of things sometimes because we, we like to play this game with them. Well, mainly Anna was talking, <laughs> but we were asking like, so what do you think this is? Just to exercise their kind of creativity. So we get to hear a lot of times like, oh, this is like a racket, a racket. How is the racket? This is a house, but where do you have a door? And we are like, here and they're like no no the doors are on the top so kind of it's kind of interesting to just interview children while they're on the playground yeah you find out a lot more about this uh, <laughs> well this is Hasebroekstraat another location um, and this is the last one in the Wondelpark which when actually we don't have this photo here but this one is sharing like this one is really blocked by the new equipment so there are like two areas of the playground this is one and the other one is the sand pit and in between there is a huge structure which is completely blocking the view, which was one of his design uh, ideas that the mother should see from one point to the other. So in this playground it completely disappeared because of this element which is placed in between. Yeah, yeah, he made this design where he had these two, two different areas. And yeah, like you said, it's, it was very important that wherever the parents would sit and, and uh, wait or interact with their children, they could see everything. And uh, I think it was in 2010 that this company placed something else. And this, stru this structure is just gigantic. So now they have to constantly, if they are there with more children, they have to run from one to the next. And it's, it's just another example of how, uh, how these things are not being taken into account. Yeah, they yeah. don't reconsider them and they don't take somehow the, the time to, to look at the ideas that were, that were once there. Um, I think this is the last clip. It's about the jumping stones. <laughs> I don't know why I have hair feet. So this is one of the playgrounds you see now, which was uh, designed as first in Amsterdam. And you saw it on the video before, but this is another angle of the picture. And you can also see in the back there, there is the only monument which actually says some information about Aldo van Eyck, which is there in the back in a kind of a, in these white color. tubes and a rainbow colors. <coughs> this is the uh, one close to Museum Plein, Jacob Obrecht. And I think, well, what happened in the 80s is that the city uh, of Amsterdam used to be all, um, uh, the public space used to be directed by one department. Um, and in the 80s, the city decided to split itself into different um, areas. So you had Stadtdelen, which also meant that each one of these areas was um, capable of designing its own public space. So whereas before there was this um, central, yeah, yeah. central point of, from where they designed playgrounds and, uh, and other er parts of public space, then this, this somehow all fell apart. And, um, they don't really communicate within each other anymore. So that's what we get also when we try to trace some information that they don't really know what's going on in the West or they don't know what's going on in the East because everyone is like following their own <coughs> identity of the area or something. And, and one of the things what we mm. notice is what happened, what started to happen then is that um, people working for the, for the areas or for the public works department, they started to uh, 
pick different play equipment from uh, catalogs or from companies and didn't really take the entire um, uh, map of the playground itself uh, into consideration but just used it and placed certain elements uh, there. And I would say randomly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think I agree. So, so here as well you see uh, you see this, uh, this sand pit, which is the only remaining uh, element of Van Eyck there, and then you see that the rest is not really coordinated or, or it was well It the thought hardest, of. hardest uh, picture to take, I think, because we just couldn't take a good picture of this playground because there was just no possibility. From any angle, there was always something too disturbing. So that also kind of proved us that uh, it's just wrong. Oh, in that sense, it's easy to, to take a beautiful photograph of an original Van Eyck playground because somehow you, you just see how well thought of they, they are. Here it's even worse. Well, it's an example of the spongy floors that have to be used. Um, I, th I don't know ex the exact uh, regulations, but if, if a certain play element is, High. is higher than a certain yeah. uh, amount, then you have to have this floor in order for, for it to, to be safe. Yeah. And what happened here is this used to be a, a playground completely designed by Van Eyck. And now you see that the, th that these stones are somehow being pushed to the side and only used as demarcation. Mm -hmm. um, this is one in the, in the center next to quite a busy road, uh, which still looks very much like uh, an original Van Eyck. Um, but we know now that this, this like, um, the right of reproducing the Aldo Van Eyck playgrounds has uh, only one company, and they uh, also can just rep uh, reproduce like this kind of a climbing frames and the igloo climbing frames, but you can find the difference in a way the how they are produced one. and you can really trace the original out of an eye frame and the new one. So this is the new ones. They, are, they have an extra lock on the top and they, are, they have a little bit different feeling. What is actually nice with, with his playgrounds is that they are the, the materials that are used are always concrete um, or aluminium and sometimes uh, wood, though not so often. And, uh, and that is, I think, one of the reasons why they fit so well into their urban surroundings. And we went to the company that, is, um, that now owns this rights and that is sometimes creating uh, Van Eyck equipment for playgrounds. But they come in all these colors now. So we came there and we mm -hmm. saw a climbing frame in, in red, yellow, blue. So we were shocked because we didn't see this before. And, and we asked, <coughs> so where did this idea come from? Um, and then they told us, well, you know, it's it's the same price whether we we have to put an extra layer on it anyway so why not give it a color, color yeah. and it was just you know it's such a pity that that this that but it's that a pity but <laughs> yeah a pity. but when we talk to them we try to also emphasize that if it's really necessary or if they don't want to think about it a little bit and we when we talked to them we saw that there was a lot of understanding but they just didn't know also a lot of information before we told them so it was they were quite open to the discussion but of course they were thinking of a color because you think of a child so you think of a colors. <laughs> <laughs> another, uh, another thing they told us is that what also happens sometimes is that they're being approached by a city to, um, to come up with a couple of new elements for an existing playground and they're simply not given enough uh, uh, money or freedom or time to, to reconsider the, the entire playground or to see how to change maybe some of the equipment that is already there or how to relocate them so it's um, it, yeah, somehow it feels like there is just um, not enough money and locations that is uh, yeah they don't they don't want to spend too much money on them basically they don't they don't provide or they don't um, yeah you know <laughs> <laughs> they somehow it's it's better to put a parking lot on a spot than uh, or a building no, than I a playground. It's more about that the public public spaces in general mm -hmm. became not such an attractive. Uh, uh, assignments for cities, of course, because they don't bring money. So we see this kind of decrease of them uh, in, a, in most of the cities nowadays. This is uh, oh, this is a nice surprise. In the end, there is one more uh, Clip. video, <laughs> <laughs> Nikos. <laughs> if, or um, it's of the playground which you showed earlier. It's a Vondel Park. It's the one which is most intact. And during the day, it's mainly kids. But during the evening hours, there is a lot of adults which are coming to the playgrounds. And that just confirms the ideology of Adolf Van Eyck that they can be used by the old generation. So that's why we want to show you how that works in a practice.
is dan vier keer overzicht. Oh ja, nee, ik denk al t- ja, tien minuutjes. Ja. Zo. Ja. ja, je moet het een beetje sneller doen. Neem maar een stop, gewoon even zoeken, dus het even zijn disk. Oh, goed. goed. Ja, dat is goed. We have 10 minutes. No, in 5 minutes the battery is done, so it's going to change it. Mm-hmm. We have to stop for a second, and then we can see. Well, and this is um, the last uh, last chapter of the book where we kind of show this ironic image where the playground or the play element of Aldo van Eyck is actually colored. And uh, that's the kind of uh, irony of the fact how we try to improve sometimes things, but not really thinking about them, but just like pasting another layer of some kind of uh, color, which I don't think that necessarily kind of help the, the projects and the playgrounds. Um, so this is a possibility for the 18th uh, Van Eyck playground in the center. Uh, when we were working on the on on the project, we were biking through the western area of the of the city, and we discovered this climbing frame with a couple of legs chopped off. It was like next to a kindergarten, but it was apparently not in use. So we were very curious about what they, if they are planning to put it back in the in the like garden or if they are planning to trash it. So we just uh, try to reach and get in contact with the director of the kindergarten, where we explained our projects and uh, why we find it interesting. And she was uh, just saying that, yes, you can just take it because it's actually too, too expensive to trash it. So uh, we were like very, yeah. <laughs> very, very upset because that's kind of like... Uh, it was such a symbol of what we were discovering and... and so and we actually also like that it became some kind of an icon of where, where these playgrounds are nowadays, so it's like half broken. Uh, we thought that it's going to be a very easy action, we just take it and we're going to exhibit it during the graduation show, which turned out to be like the project which travels nowadays through different galleries. Yeah, uh, there are certain rules regarding what you can put in a boodle box, so this was quite a bit too too big, so <laughs> and, and <laughs> but at first. It, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a hustle with this object, because uh, in the beginning we didn't really know uh, uh, like how we're gonna store it or w- what's allowed and what's not. So this is how it was, this was this first week how it was uh, exhibited and it found like its visitors in the Ritwald Academy Garden. It was just right next to the building and we still saw that the children were immediately triggered by it even though... Yeah, that was actually interesting because for us it was of course very special to find this, this uh, uh, climbing frame and to be able to, to adopt it and bring it with us. 
but when we, it was we there had to fix it we yeah. had to first fix it because it was not very stable so we had to make the pillars to put it underground a little bit to like test it a little bit but when when it was there we immediately noticed how children saw it recognized it as something uh, of their own and and started to play on it i mean there's no child that is going to say wait a minute this one has is missing a couple of legs so we're not going to use it and, and uh, I think the potential why it could be there was also that it was more considered as an art object because from the safety safety rules, I think it wouldn't be enough, the, the way we fixed it and the, the way it was positioned. And the day when the exhibition finished, we had to really remove it because the Gemeinte was really, like you can, you can get into problems once there is standing an object which is apparently a playground and if something would happen, of course, it would be our... My, our problem because we are the owners of it at the <laughs> moment. Yeah. Um, once we we gave a talk about this in England, and a couple of uh, designers also explained us that sometimes they use this trick that they um, place um, play sculptures outside, but they give them the title of being an artwork, so they don't have to deal with all these regulations regarding uh, safety for the children using them. While, while in practice they are actually being used as, uh, as elements for play. So here we were somehow uh, doing the same thing. And um, yeah, because it's so symbolic for what is happening to Von Eyck's work nowadays, we decided to bring this climbing frame with us um, when, for example, we're giving a talk. Well, we already brought it here last time and we weren't able to bring it here today, but it is sometimes traveling to, to different uh, galleries and locations. But our eventual idea is that we would like to incorporate it into the city of Amsterdam back. So we are in touch with various architects who are interested maybe to incorporate it into the project. But we, we, because we really know the story, we care about it in a way it would be implemented back in a city. This is one of the examples of the places where it was. Um, this is where we store it uh, when it's not being... Um, uh, Exhibited, yeah, exhibited somewhere. Uh, we have to put it on the roof of something so that it's not uh, on the ground level. <laughs> yeah, so that children won't use it because then again we, we get into trouble if something happens. Um, so through, uh, through a couple of friends who are working at this cultural Buurtwerkplatz, uh, Norderhof, we were able to place mm -hmm. it there. Ah, this is a good one to, uh, to end our talk with. This was here in uh, September it was, right? Uh, yeah. at the very same spot <laughs> where we are sitting <laughs> now. <laughs> um, exactly, I think so, yeah. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I think that's it for, for us, for today. Yeah. Thank you very much for Thank coming. you. <laughs> Thanks again for your presentation. And I, I've already noted a lot of things, but I huh. would like to know if any of you has something to ask or any comment that you would like to make, then... Uh, uh, I can pass the huge microphone <laughs> to somebody. Yeah? yeah um, I would say that I might be getting old and sour, probably will, but like these whole, the new structures, playing grounds, as they call it, seem to be, okay, let's put it like this, the Van Eyck playgrounds are places of freedom and imagination. If you, you don't see anything, it's just a basic structure. And when you see the, the little clip you showed the first one, you see those children running in and they see stuff. Yeah. I don't know what they see, but they see stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And then in these plastic playgrounds, mm -hmm. all the stuff is blocked. Yeah. You the colors are already there and the doors are there and it's just, what happened? Yeah. I, I think you can also observe it when you are on the playgrounds that that uh, when you're on the new stra like on the playgrounds where are these colorful structures you see a child like being enthusiastic first five minutes but losing interest very quickly as well so there is this effect where the children start to in the end like fight with each other or do something but the the, the play element is not any more important so so they stay with it five minutes and then they kind of drag their children back and everything. But with this out of an act, there is this interesting moment where they kind of keep on going from one to another or like talk one once they are hanging. So I don't also know what, what, if what was really your question, <laughs> but I, I just wanted to say that because maybe we, we, we didn't mention <laughs> it in the beginning. No, I think I, it wasn't I, really a question. <laughs> no, yeah, maybe <laughs> I like just Children are children, you know, so yeah, they are exactly, going to play yeah. anyway. 
yeah. That's, yeah. Good, that's what they're gonna do and then yeah. you'd expect them to be s creating Giving. stuff seeing things that we don't see anymore yeah. but then in these new situations they took away this Everything freedom for, yeah. for reinterpreting It's already them. there. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, as I said in the beginning, am I getting old and sour? Mm -hmm. Or should we be an advocate for... I think so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think right. what, one of the things what happened is when, when the uh, city of Amsterdam um, got uh, separated into these different areas, it was also part of getting their own identity. And part of that was... Uh, was also getting the the more colorful playground or with the fancier play equipment and of course maybe also parents that didn't know about all this ideology behind them or designers or city decision makers they they felt uh, attracted to these newer structures so somehow this but became the new standard and, and also i think it's mainly like nowadays it's ruled by the safety policy which is actually european union safety policy which even countries which are not in european union have to follow uh, because uh, this, like, it's coming more from the model of American, how the American society works, and it's all about this that if if it if something just happens on a playground, you can suddenly sue the city, and since cities don't want to take the responsibility for this anymore, they just put it back to a company because once company plays there something new, they take all the responsibility for it. They double like they check it if it's still intact. But once we were interviewing people from Gemeinte who take care of out of an ice playgrounds, they told us no accident happened in 40 years he worked for the city and nothing really happened on these playgrounds. Okay. So that was also interesting for us to see that the safety policy is becoming strict and sometimes they are very ridiculous if you read the uh, quotas or things. It's most of the time about the sizes and it's really even the small bump can be considered dangerous or uh, yeah. So, so in that case, they have also difficulties in Amsterdam to keep on out of an ex playground because they don't fit anymore. This yeah, and it would be so nice for a child to learn that when you fall down from two meters, it's part of the experience. You're gonna get hurt. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I yeah, it's it's a whole society kind of like change. <laughs> do you happen to know why out of an egg was the one that got the commission to do the playground? Because yeah. I assume uh, um, there's, there's, there's more <laughs> architects or people at that time that would... I think uh, the main reason was because at that time he was working for the Public Works Department uh, under Jacoba Mulder and Cor van Eestre and he was um, mainly working on the general extension plan of this after-war uh, areas, so uh, um, this town, town state actually, and he was not so much happy with the way they were doing this he was much more uh, pleading for a more humane uh, kind of style and architecture while uh, yeah, well these uh, areas were very much doing this uh, top-down approach and taking a, an empty area and from the top completely making this functionalist idea so it was kind of an easy solution to to give him this task so he wouldn't have to constantly disagree or work on something which he didn't fully uh, support so it was kind of like this that it, it, it it I think it yeah. was mainly that he had more human approach to the project and uh, the other architects and also the whole group of Siam and Corbusier were planning for the future, so the cities of the future. And he saw that until we get to this future, it's not going to be, it's not going to be any more relevant. So why don't we just like uh, solve the issues more in a, in a small societies of the cities and that's how we can make a bigger change than just planning for 20 years ahead. Yeah. And I think that that's why this project also fit him very well in the end. But I think Jacoba Mulder depicted him because she was very much interested also in this. Yeah, yeah, but it was a good solution to to put him on this project. And he didn't do any uh, playground designs before this, but but he really uh, made it into quite a huge project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found is. Is this working? <laughs> <laughs> what I found really interesting, espe uh, especially with one of the images that you showed where there's this like super colorful playground and then the pillars are kind of being pushed to the side. Yeah. yeah. Because you said that uh, he built the playgrounds for everybody, yeah. but it seemed like the that the pillars have been uh, transformed into um, seats for the parents, while yeah. the play playground has been completely rebuilt yeah, exactly. for the children. 
as if the, as if the new structures are there for the children and the and the play jumping stones are there just for the parents too. exactly also yeah. for the working out and it's mm -hmm. like they can kind of totally change the function the of function it. of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well that's, yeah, that's just yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i think good it's observation, a nice observation yeah. yeah yeah no it's true and it's it's part of this uh, um what we notice that when they add equipment to already existing von Eyck playgrounds that they don't often take into consideration how the composition worked or how this um, uh, somehow um, interaction or relation between the different structures worked or even the uh, sometimes, as we said before, that he, he also created these empty areas in between the play equipment where, where mobile plays could take play and then they would every now and then just dump a new play equipment in that right area, <laughs> so so it's. But you also can see that the the adults have much of a bigger problem to approach these new playgrounds, like this colorful one. You kind of feel stupid to sit around it or lean on it, or even teenagers. And these ones are quite used by all the generations. Like you, sometimes like see students, or even when we had in a graduation show, there were kids, but there were teachers. Some of the talks took place there, so it was very nice to see how how many functionalities it can gain for all the generations. So. Yeah, I think one nice uh, uh, difference is also that when when this playground of Aldo van Eyck is, is empty or when there's no children playing in them, they don't look sad or abandoned. You can still go there and, and sit on one of the benches or uh, one of the jumping stones and have lunch or have a conversation with your neighbor or just rest on your way home. And I think... Beat the you carpet. Would, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's pictures of women uh, using them to beat their carpets on. Uh, and. And I, th I don't think this would uh, happen in this modern, colorful playground, so, yeah. Um, if I'm yeah. to add, I think um, that, that quality of, of, of the possibility of appropriating uh, the structures for any given, let's say, anything that you can imagine, something that somehow, to my perception, is lacking uh, nowadays. And it yeah. comes also to what... Um, yeah. We were discussing on the fact that like there's there's too little imagination when it comes. Things have been thrown on a plate and they're not open to be reinterpreted or yeah. you know uh, perceived differently. Yeah. And it, it maybe also commenting to what um, Denise also said, which I found it quite interesting that like public space doesn't make us any money, doesn't make the city any money. Yeah. And I think basically there've been solutions that try to create public space that can be profitable and that's like how you brand the city, how you utilize, yeah. let's say, uh, the, the public space of the museum, let's say, to be able to have yeah. an Aldo Van Eyck, uh, let's yeah. say, a, a structure there in order to, to attract um, tourists and how like tourism has been, you know, um, is shaping, let's say, contemporary public space and how yeah. we perceive the city. Yeah. When it comes to like uh, engagement to a local community, that seems to somehow fall short or falls oh, yeah. into a category of, well, we pre-design everything and there's no space for interpretation or you know yeah. appropriation of it. Yeah, and in that sense, I, I think that also the the children of the city should be rec reconsidered just as important as any other, you know, as the tourist or as the the adults or, um, and I think therefore playgrounds are as important part of the public spaces, any other uh, places, so, yeah. And also maybe uh, looking through the Europe, because now we do research on various countries, you can find that uh, you can trace some of these elements in a, in a different countries, like I come from Slovakia, I can find some of these similar elements, but they are not exactly the same. So when we speak to the, to the city, poli uh, like policymakers in the cities in other countries, they usually tell us that there were trips organized abroad and then they kind of like copy and paste it. It's not really the same how they look, but they they are quite similar in a way. But when they approach the playgrounds nowadays, it feels like everyone has the same catalog. So that's what we find sad and that's why we want also, when we speak to architects, to try to emphasize that it's an attractive project to take on. It's not just two-dimensional project because sometimes we get to here, but it's very two-dimensional for architects. But I think to approach it as Aldo van Eyck is quite, uh, Quite a good example, I think. Yeah. <coughs> uh, are there any more questions or any comments that somebody would like to give? I want to say also, because I'm, I come from Iceland, mm -hmm. and I remember very well this kind of structures. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I remember very well these kind of structures also yeah. there, you yeah. know? 
So in a way that was also a catalog. Yeah. But it was a different kind of catalog. Yeah, I guess. A better one maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I knew uh, what I know that they also did is that um, at least within the Netherlands and maybe even abroad is that other cities started to ask the question uh, like you know what what is up with this public playgrounds that you're uh, creating and, and they look rather interesting um, so they were sent drawings as well to copy because he was working uh, um, for or under the uh, public works department so he wasn't a, uh, an architect doing uh, doing a job for the city department but by that his, the rights to all the things he designed were part of the city of Amsterdam. So Which is also becoming difficult nowadays because if you want to claim them for a monument they don't, there is no one who they belong to, they belong to kind of a city so that's why it's also very easy so suddenly one disappears and no one really pay attention so it's very easy it's how they disappear when like also nowadays some of the playgrounds which we showed they are already changed it's just two years that they kind of something changed there and it's rather quick and it's obvious to us that the public don't even like trace it or maybe child maybe the parents talk about it but we never really when we had the discussions with them felt that they they can also I don't know like they, they criticize it or no one really speaks about it so mm -hmm. maybe our work is just mainly to kind of inform the public yeah <laughs> and in that sense to to make him into an an example example of how how you can design very good uh, playgrounds for children and all the things that you can take into consideration and maybe hopefully inspire uh, cities to to create more von Eyck playgrounds but even to come up with uh, similar solutions or designs so yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. actually maybe Japan is the only country when we <laughs> go through the, <laughs> through the research which is quite good in designing play playgrounds nowadays so if you want to look into well done, <laughs> playground nowadays, maybe <laughs> the Japan is the only country. That's probably the next project coming up. <laughs> <you> know. <laughs> Who knows? Let's, yeah. let's, let's have you next year like, presenting <laughs> Great. that. Great. Yeah. But thanks again for, for Thank joining us. Much. Thank and you for, for giving us. an insight on yeah. your story along with Aldo Van Eyck's story. Yeah. Um, thanks again. Uh, let's have uh, a five minute break just mm -hmm. to grab a drink, have yeah. a cigarette, and then we can continue with Tanya. Yes? Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Well, I will just leave it.